I don't want to be eight years old. Uh, I'll just have to wait for three more weeks before I get. I will call to order the Monday, January 22nd meeting of the Verona Common Council and we'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next we'll have the roll call. Ms. Clark, if you would, please. Alderperson Diaz. Here. Alderperson Doyle. Here. Alderperson Gaskell. Here. Alderperson Linder. <coughs> Here. Alderperson Riki. Here. Alderperson Steiner. Here. Alderperson Touche. Present. We have a quorum, so we will proceed with the meeting. Um, what I've asked to do, what I've asked our city administrator, Jeff Mikorski, to do is, I know there's some, I'm not criticizing anybody, but there's some misinformation, miscommunication so far regarding one of the items that I know that people want to talk about tonight. So we thought it would be beneficial if we just made a, a real quick comment prior to that. So, Mr. Mikorski, if you would, please. Sure. I think there's been a lot of discussion regarding the, uh, the clean site comment regarding uh, Sugar Creek Elementary School property. And I think everyone, uh, uh, council is in agreement that uh, the discussion did not include the new century building on the Sugar Creek Elementary property. Uh, we're, we're mainly talking about the Sugar Creek Elementary uh, portion of that property. Thank you, Jeff. So with that, we are going to open it up to public comment. If this is the first time that you've been here, um, there is a sign-up sheet at the podium. We would ask that you would sign that sheet. And please, not only for our benefit, but for those watching at home, if you would state your name and address. And uh, we have no time limits. We would just ask that you be respectful of other individuals in the audience. So with that, uh, anyone who wants to speak under public comment? Hi everyone, uh, my name is Jesse Charles. I'm with the Verona Area Historical Society. I live here in Verona and thank you very much for the clarification. It's really good to hear that. I know um, we're at a little bit of a disadvantage where when closed session happens, we the YouTube video goes blank and I wait and then when it comes back, there was the short little summary of what happened there and not much else. So we kind of had to go on that. Um, I just wanted to say first off before I start, thank you all for your time tonight and thanks for all the work that you all do to keep Verona a great place to live. Thank you for everyone who came out tonight. Um, it shows a lot of support for local history for this building. I know it's, we don't know exactly where it's going to end up, but I think kind of the, the statement people are making here tonight is going to carry over to this building's future beyond just tonight, beyond the next year. I think it's, it's a great thing to see. Um, one of our things as, in, as a historical society is we are so, see ourselves as partners with the city. We provide advice on historical matters. We do research when needed. Um, when Adam needs pictures of old buildings, we're on that. Uh, we also try to encourage the public to engage their representatives when issues come up that they care about, which I think is a good thing for everybody. So why are we here today? It's, it's been two years since I've rallied the troops to come to a council meeting, um, as I think a lot of you remember. Uh, so why today? We're here to make some comments about the 100-year-old New Century building and scenarios that might uh, unfold regarding its fate, even given or not given the clean statement. I know that the whole parcel of land is still up for debate in this land swap that could happen. So I think it's important that we kind of let you guys all know what we f how we feel about that. Um, it, it's important for me to say that one of our goals as a historical society is to be ahead of what's happening. So if we're going to weigh in on a um, decision, you know, like this, we need to do it before agreements are inked and voted on. I mean, I know from being other sessions here that too many people wait until the last moment to come to you. And, and if you had a quarter for every time, right, when the, the deal is done and someone comes to complain, I, I, I want us to always be ahead of this. Um, I know that the New Century building was discussed or the land was discussed at the last council meeting, but we don't know exactly what was discussed or how you feel about it. So um, a couple things that we believe to be true, and you can correct us later, is that there is a city staff was instructed to draft a proposal, which will likely include the transferring of the land and or buildings on the site, which buildings was not said. So we don't know exactly which buildings could be transferring from the school to the city. There was the comment about the clean, which I've watched that video over and over so many times. So thank you for the clarification. I, I appreciate that knowing that it's not currently in that, under that umbrella of clean. And I know a timeline was not set, but we, we did learn that the topic will be up for council discussion tonight. So we thought following what I mentioned before, we want to get here and, and talk to you before this ends up on something I read in the press, something that was been voted on today. Um, 
I know there's urgency from the school district to kind of get this all sorted out as quickly as possible. So here we are. So there, um, there are a lot of reasons to keep this building around. I'll mention them here. The plot of lands had a school on it since at least 1861. The current building dates back to 1917, and original blueprints show it's still as many original components like it did back then, and much of it is still the same. It schooled many multi-generational families where the kids who went there grew up, had kids who went there. I think some of them are in the audience uh, tonight. It's also been a community center and a gathering place. Uh, real quick, just, just kind of for reference, who's here to support the New Century Building by show of hands? So um, I'll take a picture of this later so I can show it to the school district as well. Um, I think perhaps the most important reason that this particular building needs to be saved is because it, I think it might be the oldest structure still under public control um, in Verona. There are older buildings in Verona, but they're publicly owned and could be gone tomorrow. And I've noticed a lot of people will say, you know, Verona doesn't save anything. And that's, you know, to some extent unfair because a lot of what we've lost has been privately owned. In this case, we have a publicly owned a building. So our recommendations, we'd like to make some recommendations to city staff uh, tonight and to the elders and city council. Uh, please don't draft a proposal for this land swap that includes demolishing the building. Um, going back to this whole clean site thing, um, I apologize if we read too much into that. I just wanted to make sure people spoke out in case the building was headed in that direction. If the city does acquire the land, inclu including New Century, which could happen, uh, request that the building is turned over intact if Sugar Creek building needs to be removed, then you know do so and patch up the hole on, on the old building. Um, if, if the city does end up with the building, then we would recommend doing an RFI, again, like we did with the Matt's house, that gives preference to uh, uses that keep the building as intact as possible. And this worked wonderfully for the Matt's house. It, was, it first looked very hopeless, as I know you'll remember, and then things really turned around and now it's a success story. So there might be some community-based use for this building might be more developers like Mr. Ross who have a use for it. And this one, I guess, I really want to stress, which is if you could all please be as transparent as possible on what you each think about this issue. If there's a closed session, I'm assuming there probably will be one, um, please follow that up by summarizing maybe each of your thoughts so we kind of can get a tally. That's uh, good to hear that the clean thing was not meant for this, but I'd, I'd really like to know where you all kind of, I got some taste of that on social media, which is really nice and I appreciate that, but it matters to us and a lot of people and it would be good to know where you all sit since it's kind of in your hands. Um, so I just want to say thank you for your consideration that you've given in the past to uh, preserving our shared history here in Verona, most recently the Matt's House. And um, yeah, so if we're premature in making these recommendation, recommendations of the council, let us know what the next best steps are, if we should be talking to the school district right now or if we should wait till your deal is done and you're voting on it. I'm definitely all ears and I want to know how to be the most effective in keeping this building around. I think everyone here does. So uh, we would definitely uh, appreciate your input. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Charles. Nice to see you again. Good to see you too, John. It'll be weird doing this in the future without you there. <laughs> Anyone else who wishes to speak under public comment? Hi, my name is Stephanie Luer. Um, I'm not a very good public speaker, so me doing this means it's something I feel really strongly about. Um, I didn't grow up in Verona, but I've lived here th since 2002. Um, my hometown is a very small town in western Wisconsin, but one thing um, when I go home, I have this feeling of uh, familiarity, of something that's welcoming me home. I see buildings that have been there my entire life, and when I go there, I have a real hometown feel. And um, it's something um, when I go back I just you know feel like I'm coming home and I hope to have that same feeling for my kids when they grow up and they come back to Verona um, those same historic buildings that stood when I was a child still stand there today they've taken great care in those buildings and made them a real part of the community um, and I hope to see the same for Verona. I like the idea of my kids coming to Ver when they're adults and saying, this is where I bought my groceries. This is where I went to school, as in the New Century Building. Both my children have gone to school in that building. And the school has served as, um, New Century Building has served as a school for many generations of Verona residents. And I ask you to consider preserving this building for the next 100 years whether it become an office building or apartments or a gallery or shops or another school, whatever it becomes in its next 
um, future. I think it's important to preserve history in Verona and it helps unite all of the generations of people that make up our great city. And I really applaud the city for preserving the Matt's house. I think that's something really important for everyone in our community. And um, I hope that we continue to have that hometown USA feel where people see familiar buildings, they see places that they love and that they've grown up with. And um, I hope that you will not require the school district to demolish that building. So thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kate and I'm a fifth grader at New Century School. And I think that the building is historic and that Verona should keep it because other people can enjoy it. And then I do not want you to tear it down because it's a special part of Verona. I think that the building is ready for another 100 years and I hope we can preserve it. Thank you. Thank you. And Stephanie and Kate, you both did a great job. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lily Cole, and I'm here today to talk to you about why I don't want New Century to be knocked down. The first thing is New Century is kind of like a second home to me. It's just like a fun little cool place where you know where everything is. And I know this school is moving to Badger Ridge in 2020, but we can still use it as a museum or something. And New Century is one of the first buildings of Verona in an old schoolhouse. There is so much history that fits into this tiny building and we can use all of that history for a museum. So I really hope that you don't knock it down so you can use it for more than just a big pile of smashed bricks. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lily. You did a great job as well. Anyone else wishing to speak? Anyone else wishing to speak? I always ask three times. Anyone else wishing to speak? <clears throat> Seeing none, we are going to move on then with the agenda. Uh, next under, uh, actually next on the agenda, we have approval of minutes from the January 8th meeting. And those minutes were included with your packet. What's your pleasure? We have a motion by Ms. Rieke. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Doyle. Were there any additions or corrections to the minutes of the previous meeting? Any additions or corrections? Seeing none, all those in favor of the approval of the minutes signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carried and the minutes have been approved. Um, under Mayor's business this evening, committee appointments, I mentioned at the last meeting that we had a vacancy uh, due to a resignation on the Parks, Recreation, and um, Parks, Recreation and Forestry Commission. And what's interesting about the, the chair's position of the Park, Recreation, and Forestry Commission is that individual, according to our ordinances, automatically serves on the Planning Commission. So Derek Johnson, who I introduced you to um, at a previous meeting, his first choice of what he wanted to serve on was the Planning Commission. So I had a conversation with him, and he is willing to serve on as the chair of the Park and Recreation and Forestry Commission, and then also would be on the Planning Commission. So I'm asking for your confirmation of his appointment uh, to the Park, Recreation, and Forestry Commission. Move approval. We have a motion by Mr. Linder. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Doyle. Uh, any questions? I provided some background information on him before. Seeing no questions, all those in favor of confirmation signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carried. And staff, if they have not reached out to them already, or already they will be reaching out to Mr. Johnson. Uh, next we have uh, this is an annual proclamation that we do on the Adult Crossing Guard uh, Proclamation. So I'll read that. Whereas Verona's Adult School Crossing Guards provide an individual service in helping to ensure the safe passage of our youngest, most vulnerable pedestrians, that is children walking between home and school. And whereas Adult School Crossing Guards typically serve with a dedication that discounts the rigor of harsh weather, split shifts, and heavy traffic, and whereas for more than four decades, adult school crossing guards have served the community, and whereas adult school crossing guards help reinforce in the minds of young people they assist, the importance of traffic hazard identification and safe street crossing behavior. And whereas school assemblies, school board resolutions, police department support, parent-teacher organization observances, local news coverage, and especially kind words from children 
will help convey the gratitude of our community for the life-saving, injury-reducing role that Verona's adult school crossing guards play. Now, therefore, I, John Holcomer, Mayor of the City of Verona, do hereby proclaim January 22nd, January 26th, through January 26, 2018, as Adult School Crossing Guard Recognition Week. Um, and that proclamation has been signed, and we will be passing that along to um, the, uh, set the uh, breakfast for school crossing guards on Wednesday, this week, Wednesday morning. So this is, you know, when we think about how cold we've had some weather recently, or when we have snow, or when we have rain. I was in Stevens Point all day today, and it just poured up there and snow later. Um, if school's in session, the school crossing guards are working. It doesn't matter what the weather is or anything else. So we really give them a lot of credit. And I've heard from a number of families, too, and, and we mentioned it here in the proclamation. For many young kids, that may be one of the most important adult figures in their life. So we, we really appreciate it. We don't just say that. We really appreciate what the school crossing guards uh, do to protect the young folks and also to be some support there, uh, some support that many of us m might not realize that they really need and aren't getting. So uh, we will definitely pass along our thanks to the school crossing guards, and thank you for allowing me to uh, read the proclamation. So with that, we move to announcements. Are there any announcements this evening? Mr. Steiner, please. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I just want to follow up and fill you in on the Historical yeah. Society meeting from last Saturday. We had a speaker, a resident from the city of Verona, uh, John Hacks, who, who works in human development, I might say. Uh, he works down in South Africa in a cave, and they uncovered a remnant that will possibly change how we look at the development of humans on this earth. And it was an outstanding presentation, and he had us all spellbound for well over an hour, and uh, I just wanted to give him a little shout out. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Steiner. Any other announcements this evening? Uh, Ms. Clark, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wanted to announce that the last time to pay property taxes online will be Thursday, January 25th at 11.59 p.m., and also that in-person <coughs> absentee voting for the February 20th spring primary will begin Thursday, February 1st. Thank you very much for that. Any additional announcements this evening? I'm not seeing any, so we will proceed with the agenda. Next, we have the administrator's report. Mr. Mikorski, please. Thank you. Uh, there was a comment regarding uh, transparency regarding the, the, the Sugar Creek Elementary. I just wanted to make everybody aware that um, the, the term sheet that, that council is looking at right now is going to be put into a development agreement. That development agreement will be voted on and, and discussed um, uh, openly and then also the the property itself um, it's not going to be transferred or conveyed uh, if all works well, well uh, for three years so there's a lot of time and opportunity uh, that uh, discussions can be uh, can brought up and be made in public so uh, it, it's not as if something's gonna happen today that that is going to uh, seal the fader and it wasn't on uh, wasn't discussed openly in city, at city council so just wanted to make sure that everybody's aware of that um, as far as uh, meetings coming up there's going to be a joint meeting with the uh, capital area regional planning commission and the madison area transportation planning board tomorrow uh, tuesday uh, january 23rd at seven o'clock that's at the city uh, county building that's 210 martin luther king jr drive uh, room one, 103A. And I guess uh, the, the biggest focus of the agenda will be uh, the possible merging of those two agencies. So uh, uh, how that would impact um, municipalities, um, we're not quite sure right now, but uh, those discussions will be taking place. Um, also, the uh, Madison Metropolitan Sewer District Commission will be meeting uh, January 25th at 8 a.m., uh, at their uh, headquarters uh, coming up February 20 uh, I'm sorry February 4th will be the beginning of the uh, Sunday hours at the library uh, the library will be open from 1 till 5 on Sundays now uh, during the school year so uh, wanted to make sure everyone was aware of that 
Uh, and last, um, uh, I've been putting together a 2018 um, citizen survey that um, it's in draft form, um, provides to the mayor to look at it. Uh, basically, hoping to put something out uh, in front of uh, in front of the r residents uh, through our POCO service uh, that can provide some feedback on um, on the services, feedback on information um, about the livability of the city, and uh, uh, provide feedback and possibly start moving into um, uh, either strategic planning or or visioning for the city. So um, uh, with that, I'll be providing uh, uh, copies to council as well as that uh, is posted. That's all I have. Are there any questions for Mr. McCarsky? Mr. Diaz, please. Thank you. Um, in regard to the comments about New Century School, um, which uh, governmental body, the city or the school district would be best suited for historical preservation? I understand if you want to defer that to Adam or, or someone else. I think, um, well, you know, it, it depends on, uh, the school's been uh, uh, in the uh, school district's hands for a long time. Um, I guess you can see if it's being preserved uh, adequately uh, through their work. Um, and we've had, uh, the, the city's had a history of uh, uh, looking at uh, historic uh, buildings uh, with uh, the, the Matt's house as, a, as an option on that. Um, Adam, if you have any. I was, I was just gonna say, I think we have to be real careful until we have the conversations with the school, uh, school district to finalize um, part of that agreement before we have too much conversation at the council level. Any other questions for Mr. McCorsky? Any other questions? Seeing none, uh, thank you, Jeff. And we'll move on to the engineer's report. Mr. Monpass, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. One quick update. AECOM submitted the right-of-way plat for the bike pet improvements on County Trunk M and Locust to the city, and I believe Theron received signatures this evening on that or are part of that, and uh, AECOM is continuing to work forward to completion of those plans with a bid an advertisement in April. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, any questions for Mr. M for I almost said Mikorski for Mr. Monpass? Any questions? Seeing none. Thank you, Jeff. Finance Committee, Ms. Doyle, please. Under agenda item 10A1, discussion and possible action regarding payment of the bills, I'll make a motion to pay the bills in the amount of thirteen million dollars two hundred sixty-six thousand four hundred fifty dollars and eighty cents. We have a motion by Ms. Doyle. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Linder. Ms. Doyle, please. Sure. And by way of explanation, the bills are a higher amount than usual this month because we had the pass-throughs for our January tax settlements to the Dane County Treasurer, Madison Area Technical College District, and the Barona Area School District. We also had our fourth quarter, fourth quarter dues to the Madison Sewer District as well. Thank you. Questions or comments for staff or for the Finance Committee? Questions or comments? Seeing none, all those in favor of the approval of the payment of the bill signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carried. Ms. Doyle, anything else from the Finance Committee? Just to update the council, we did receive an update from Dana Investments, which has been managing a portion of the city's investment portfolio for about six months now, um, and we'll continue to keep the council updated on any developments from that, and as always, folks are welcome to attend those updates. Thank you. Next, we will move to Public Safety and Welfare Committee. Mr. Touche, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I make under item 10B1, I'm making a motion to approve ordinance number 18-098, amending section 10-1-41 of the Code of Ordinances, City of Verona, Wisconsin, related to pedestrian regulations. We have a motion by Mr. Touche. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Casco. Mr. Touche, please. Uh, this ordinance is intended to restrict a person staying on the road medians and islands, which creates traffic and safety issues. The ordinance prohibits staying for an extended length of time in the road medians and islands or approaching an operating vehicle unless it is legally parked. The Public Safety and Welfare Committee recommended approval uh, during our meeting earlier today. Thank you, Mr. Touche. Questions or comments for, <coughs> excuse me, either the committee or for staff? 
Ms. Doyle, please. Uh, I guess I'm just curious to see what prompted this, if this has been an ongoing issue in the city or if this is more preemptive. Mr. Touche, uh, it, it, it's a preemptive move, essentially. Um, some, it's following in line with a lot of regulations that are happening at uh, Madison and Fitchburg level as well. Seeing no further questions, the motion before you is to approve ordinance number 18-908. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, opposed, no. And that motion carries. Anything else from Public Safety and Welfare Committee? That is all for tonight. Thank you. We will move to Planning Commission. Mr. Sayer, please. Thank you. The item we have on the agenda tonight is discussion regarding an initial concept review of a proposed development within the city's north neighborhood. A developer has submitted a request for a review of a 198-acre development that would allow for the construction of 377 single-family homes, 250 multifamily apartments, and 13 acres of commercial land. This project requires various approvals, including annexation, developer agreements, and pl plan approvals. The Planning Commission discussed the project on January 2nd of 2018. Comments from the Planning Commission included discussion on road widths, discussion regarding parkland areas, a desire to see more single-family versus multifamily, questions about stormwater, a, a desire to see a school site included in the development, and the need for the development to provide sufficient pedestrian connections. The Public Works Committee discussed the project on January 8th of 2018. Comments from the committee included discussion regarding road widths, maintenance of common areas, and connectivity. The Park Board discussed the project on January 17th of 2018. Comments from the Park Board included general support of developing the land, discussion about potential parkland dedication requirements, and discussion regarding what park improvements the developer would install and which improvements would be maintained by the city. The Council is encouraged to provide feedback and recommendations to the applicant on the concept. No formal mo motion is required as this is the conceptual review of the project. Um, the developer is here tonight and uh, Ron Henshu would like to provide a brief presentation to the, the Council uh, on the project and that after that the, the Council is encouraged to provide feedback and ask questions of the developer. Thank you, Mr. Sayre, and welcome, Mr. Henshu. Good evening. <clears throat> Let me introduce our team first, and I'm going to try to, I think most of you have sat through a couple of different presentations, so I'm going to try to uh, keep it brief. Uh, um, I don't know if it's good fortune or not, but we had asked that Rick Harrison be with us this evening, who is a national planner and actually is uh, um, the uh, creator of the design concepts we're going to talk about this evening. But uh, his flight out of Minneapolis was canceled today due to weather, so he was unable to, to attend. So let me introduce the team, and then I'm going to discuss quickly some concepts and then go through some visuals with you, okay? Um, here tonight is Dennis Midtoon and his wife Kim. They're actually the owners of... Um, a significant portion of the land. Um, we have actually, as the developer, have closed on 80 acres of the land at this time as well. So there's 200 acres, and we're submitting um, for the entitlements uh, jointly at the same time. Okay. As I mentioned, I'm Ron Henshu with Ford Development Group. Fred DeVillers from Ford Development Group is our Vice President of Entitlements, and he, uh, if we get into technical aspects, I'll probably ask him to step to the podium. Um, and then with us from JSD Professional Services is Rachel Holloway, who handles planning and entitlement issues for us, and then Bill Dunlop, who should be somewhere behind me here. He'll handle any stormwater utility related, okay? Um, and, I, and I handed out um, uh, what I'm gonna talk about to each of you, you should have it. Um, I thought that might be a little larger than the screens that you have to look at these days, so I thought that might be helpful. Um, so let's talk about um, the items as we get to some of the, the, the more visual pieces. Um, first, I want to talk about when we, we met with the plan commission, first I want to tell you we're excited about this project. We think that for the owner of the property, for us as a developer, for the city of Verona, this can be a legacy type project. It's a significant amount of acreage. It has just a beautiful topography to it. It's the next area of development that would be annexed into the city for a lot of reasons. This, we believe, is a premier development. Um, as part of doing our research to understand exactly 
what approach could be taken here. Of course, we reviewed the North Neighborhood Comprehensive Plan, which includes, I believe, 1,600 acres, of which this is 200 of those acres. And as we're researching it, actually on the first slide that I have in front of you is direct quotes that have come out of the North Neighborhood Plan. And I used to be involved a lot in visioning and other uh, exercises with um, entities, uh, including municipalities, by the way. But nonetheless, uh, I, I always go to those, uh, the, the plan here is the vision that you had for this neighborhood. And we selected some uh, key concepts that were in that plan. Um, the plan talks about having a complete neighborhood, meaning complete meaning you've got the ability to walk within the neighborhood, to bike within the neighborhood, and obviously to have vehicular traffic within the neighborhood. Um, slower speeds on the street so that the that there's you know less concern um, with safety would be one of the reasons you want slower speeds walking in the neighborhood should be a pleasant and interesting activity um, and that there be a variety of public spaces meaning spaces where you could have social gatherings um, uh, one thing about vision is is that you often have descriptive words that guide you and create an image it's, it's one thing to have those on paper it's another thing to create that feeling within the neighborhood. And what I'd like to do tonight as we're wrapping things up is to show you that as we looked at the type of design that could be um, appropriate here, that we've considered those items and I think accomplish everything that was in the comprehensive plan for the North neighborhood. Um, and, and, and it's the feel that we wanna get across to you tonight, okay? Um, let's go to the second slide there. Um, when we started to take a look around there's a number of different methodologies on how you design neighborhoods. Um, we happen to land on one. It really uh, is um, called a curvilinear design. Um, I have a tendency to refer to it as a Coven concept, but that's only because it's easier to say and it's one small component of it. But basically, it's a curvilinear design, not a, a grid method of, of development, okay? Now, question that could be asked is, you know, why are we bringing this new design to you here in Verona and why at this time? Uh, ultimately, um, one of the main reasons which we've highlighted there is uh, uh, your community here is known for the acceptance of new ideas. Huh? I don't think you have to travel very long on the EPIC uh, site and see that um, design concepts are different than what you may have seen and what other communities may have allowed. So it's always important when you have a new design concept to go to a willing community and, and you've shown that willingness. Um, as I mentioned, it's consistent with the vision for the North neighborhood. Um, Technology is relevant. This design that we have in front of you, if we had presented it some 10, 15 years ago, it would have been a lot more difficult to carry out because of technology at the time as it related to GPS and, and uh, engineering design concepts and how you would stake those out in the field. But in today's world, it's an easy one to execute. Um, this is an environmental friendly approach. I'll talk about this later on, but it's important in development this, these days that we consider the environment. That concept had gotten lost for many years, not just in subdivisions, but in buildings and other design concepts. Um, I've talked about the size and scope of the project and why something unique would be, we think, um, um, viable here and, and appropriate here. And then uh, obviously the location is ideal. It's the next area to develop with the major infrastructure that's going in on Highway M and PD, it's gonna do nothing but create more value and opportunities for this area, okay? Um, some of the advantages of the design I wanna to touch on and then I'll move into the rest of it. Huh? This design creates a more interesting streetscape. You'll see that in the visuals later on. Essentially, as you're coming to intersections, as you're going down the pedestrian trails, you're gonna feel like you're in a park-like setting throughout the development, not just when you are in an actual park. Um, there's significantly reduced street infrastructure uh, uh, based on the, we had done a grid method design before we chose to go with this design. The street length is 20% less in this design than it was in the method that we originally proposed or were thinking about coming forward with. Well, you take a you look at 20% less asphalt, 20% less curb gutter, sidewalks, it, it, it's a significant decrease in the amount of um, uh, surface that needs to deal with stormwater as well as just cost and maintenance uh, both on the short term and long term basis to the city. Um, one of the keys is improved viewing corridors. I'll talk about this later on, but it's designed so each homeowner, as you look out your windows, 
You're not looking at a house next to you or a house across the street. The angles are changed so that you're always down some longer viewing cor corridor, whether it's a stormwater pond, whether it's a landscape feature at an intersection, something that is just much more appealing to look at than the house next door. Um, actually, the methods in the design are improve the safety for both pedestrians and vehicular tra traffic. I'll go over that in a little bit. And they all result in ultimately higher re real estate values it carries from the first homeowner to the second to the third homeowner. One more um, item and then I'll get into the details. Um, that the environment, it, it, it's important in today's world, a lot of corporations, entities are trying to lower their carbon footprint. Uh, an example here again using Epic is they ultimately um, have a, a wind farm that they purchased north of Madison in order to be generating electricity because they have the concept of a zero carbon footprint. Well, that's appropriate for all of us. Even in development, we need to be considering that. So, so a couple things that I want to highlight as it relates to the design. Um, the, the, the design maintains the topography of the land. So we're not going in there and regrading and shaping the land and in many cases flattening it in order to allow for the development. Um, we first designed around the pedestrian trails and then designed around the vehicular um, traffic before we even laid the lots in the development. So you don't start with the lots, you end with the lots. So there's a significant uh, advantage and also um, um, it's better you know, for the environment to maintain the topography and let the natural beauty of the land be designed into the development. It allows for improved stormwater management. You'll see as we go through, we're, we're having less impervious surface and more recirculation of the stormwater. So we deal with our own stormwater within the development, but allow it to infiltrate in multiple ways. Um, I talked about the surface. Uh, it actually encourages walking and biking. So, and all of the walking and biking in the development is off the streets. It is not on the streets. So we don't have any bike lanes on the streets where you'll be sharing traffic with vehicles. You can move through the entire development and connect to the developments to the east, to the west, to the south without having to go on any residential streets. Um, Smaller carbon footprint, if Rick was here, he has this exciting slide that shows if you don't have in a grid method where you have three or four stop signs in a row to get to your um, uh, driveway, uh, here there's fewer stop signs and more continuous movement of traffic so you don't have the starting, stopping, starting, stopping, which creates for inefficient fuel use. And um, I, I won't bear you the details of going into that slide, but can demonstrate uh, uh, the, that, that that is, uh, in fact, a uh, fuel savings for everyone. All right. Enough of why the design we think is a good design and, and, uh, and actually we've gotten good feedback from the Plan Commission, Public Works and Parks in regards to the design in general. We're working on some details that, that we will <clears throat> make changes, adjustments, or leave as is when we ultimately present it to you depending on what is decided. But. Um, we continue to meet with senior staff. I would indicate, as Adam had said, some of the concerns we're still working on are street widths. Street widths are affecting parking concerns and, and um, snow removal concerns. So we're working on that with staff and um, in the committees. Um, we're also working on the school site um, that was originally designed in the North Neighborhood Plan. It's currently not in our plan. It doesn't mean that we don't have plans for that within the North neighborhood and, and we have some ideas that we hope to meet with the school later this week on and before we come back we will have a resolution to that issue. Okay. Um, overall to reiterate a couple of things that, um, that um, Adam said, uh, uh, currently in the, in the 40 acres approximately 37th at Abut Highway M there's a commercial mixed use gateway it's going to be the entrance to the development, the, the plan for that Boulevard as it comes in and the landscaping around it will make for a great entrance that ultimately will move its way into the residential subdivision. Um, currently there's 250 multi-family units that we're proposing there and a variety of, of mixed use commercial retail in that acreage there. Now tonight I'm not going to talk much about that because that's really more of a standard design concept than the residential subdivision. So 
I want to talk more about that. <clears throat> In the residential neighborhood, currently there's 267 what we call traditional single family lots, and then there's 110 villas. Um, the villas, some people refer to them as carriage homes, bay homes, there's other concepts, but it's a more dense product where you can, can get more homes in a given area, but it's really not, it, that's one of the reasons for it, but it's also intended to provide a, uh, another um, class of product for the homeowner. So if you take a look between the villas and the single family residents, we should be able to offer um, homes to almost every, um, you know, to the majority of the asset classes that you, that would want to purchase within the Corona area. Um, so that's, a, that's an overview of the project. Now I just want to highlight some of the slides that were in the um, <coughs> packet that you had just to help you maybe understand it a little bit more. So I'm on the a slide that was in the, Submission, if you guys can take a look and see what's on the screen. Um, <coughs> excuse me. What I want to highlight is on the residential, you see kind of that darker yellow, kind of almost a mustard color. That would be the villas. And, and as I mentioned, there's a, about 111 of those. So those on a density basis, they average around four and a half units of density per acre. Okay. The lighter yellow is the single family um, lots in, in those average about 3.4 units of density per acre on the land they're sitting on. Um, the green area is what we have asked the, the Parks Committee to consider for park dedication. So there's approximately 20 acres of area that is highlighted in that darker green and based on the plan as it's submitted would require about 22 acres of parkland dedication. Okay. Um, there's approximately 16 acres of storm water. Um, we've done an initial calculation as we get further down the road and submit more detailed plans. We'll have to verify that, but we have approximately 16 acres of storm water that's designated that is a combination of retention and infiltration. Okay. Um, overall, as you take a residential look at it, I think, and Fred, you can correct me, but I think when you consider the park space, the, the, the medium density, the single family, we have 2.4 um, units of dwelling per acre, okay? Um, on the next slide, what I wanna just highlight a couple of things for you, and I don't expect you to be able to see that, but in the, this has actually been updated as of January 5th, so it's a new slide. So after we met with the plan commission, we made a, a number of immediate tweaks. Um, we have changed the street width from our original submission. So now I, I believe there's really only three widths of street. There's 40 foot widths on the main streets, which we called street A and B. The other residential streets are 36 feet. And then the one way on the cul-de-sacs are 22 feet in width. So we've made a number of changes in the width of those streets. It's still an item that we're having discussion with the, uh, with the um, staff about, but we have made changes in that street width already. Um, the villa areas did not have any parking. If you take a look in the villa areas now, after every six or seven villas, there'll be a small area for parking. That parking um, we're requesting that the street that goes through the villas be dedicated to the public. Those parking areas would not be, those would be maintained by the homeowners association, but provide additional parking, okay? And then the third change that we made is um, there was three connections to the south. Um, we understand after we submitted our concept plan that Kettle Creek North, which is to the south of us, have, has changed one of their um, air is coming through, uh, will be coming through a, a replat and has eliminated one of the connections to this neighborhood. So we eliminated that as well. I think they're using that area for stormwater. Okay. So this plan here is slightly different than the one we had provided earlier with those subtle changes. Okay. Let me talk about a few other items quickly and then I'll get to some visuals and then you can ask your questions. The next page on my, um, of my presentation is uh, the pedestrian um, connector. So this is also something that was in the original submission. 
I peeled it out because as you, as you take a look at this, wanted to highlight, you can see all of the numerous pedestrian connectors within this development. So the, the darker connectors that run east-west and north-south are a larger multi-trail, 10-foot wide multi-trail that's going to have significant landscaping and, and stormwater stream connected with it. Um, so those would we would deem to be the major connectors east-west and north-south, okay? The other connectors then that are highlighted in, in red are the meandering sidewalks and their intermediate connectors that will go from a cul-de-sac to a main entrance and the like. So, so those would be five feet, I believe, in width. Is that correct, you guys? Um, so if you, if you take a look at how pedestrians and also bicycles can move about the development, those are all ways to move about the development that don't, do not involve getting on the, um, on the local streets. Okay, so you can see there's significant connectors there. Um, those are really encouraged. They're for encouraging people and they're designed in such a way that will create the opportunities to have social gathering spaces to go east, west, north, south without having to, and to connect to the other aspects of the city, okay? <clears throat> All right, now I'll get to some visuals and then I'll let you go. I've, I've highlighted four things within the visuals that you'll see. Uh, meandering walks, the first three, which are the meandering walks, the parks and common areas, which are scattered throughout the development, and the stormwater management, which is really the combined requirements of stormwater management with the amenities are really kind of all uh, what I would say are a look and a feel. They're all integrated. So you can't just say it's one piece, it's the linear multi-trail that makes this development. It's the meandering sidewalks that add interest. You really need to take a look at all three of them to get a feel for what the development really is going to feel like. Um, the last item is really relates to the look and feel of homes themselves and the homeowner when they're in their yards. So um, some visuals for you, okay? Um, the, the next slide is really one that Rick Harrison uses in his presentation. I just wanted to kind of highlight the meandering walks are really intended to flow with the street. You, you, you won't be able to walk on a meandering walk without you know, paying attention to what's going on around you because you're not walking on a straight line. So they add interest, but they also keep you focused on what you're doing. There's a multi-purpose to them. And if you take a look at the next page this is how that look and feel could be many many years from now so um, this is an actual neighborhood Dean Parkway in St. Louis Park but you can see this is a meandering walk that goes through that neighborhood and it's a not a new concept actually um, we've gotten away from some really good design concepts but but this is how the sidewalks are going to be within the development they will meander just as they do on this illustration um, the next one is another um, view of the same development whereby you'll see large open areas with walks that meander through there and, and how the view uh, can, can look. It will look beautiful immediately, obviously will look better as the landscape develops, okay? So that's the, the meandering walks and some pictures of what that neighborhood would look like. Uh, in terms of the parks and the common space, what I wanna highlight is that you, the key is that a large number of residents will have direct access to the park areas via trails, not via the streets. So the trails will get you there. And then once again, I've got a whole series of slides that kind of show the, the essence of the development. This first one here is, is a, an actual new development that was recently done that is a picture from above. And, and what I wanna highlight just to give you a visual is, is um, I'll go on to that screen and if you, can you see in the lower left that large cul-de-sac with a gazebo in the middle of it? I mean that when we're when we're saying a cul-de-sac with a gazebo in it, that's a large cul-de-sac. It shows you the size of them. So there truly are and why we have multi-trails going to them because they truly are will be set up in a park-like setting and they will be gathering spaces not just for that individuals that live on that cul-de-sac but for those around there that have access to the trail system so you can see the size and scope 
The other thing that you can see from above is how meandering walks work, how open things are at intersections. If you kind of go to the, to the follow that cul-de-sac and the multi-trails to the right, you can see how it opens up at that intersection. And those are opportunities and we're going to have landscaping and rain gardens and many of them so that they are you know, not only working to infiltrate stormwater but to beautify the area. So that's a, that's a picture from above. Um, the next few slides then, I, we're in your packet, I just mm -hmm. wanted to highlight them. These are actually, this is how that multi-trail will look. Um, as you go down it, it's a linear parkway that isn't just 10 to 12 feet wide, it's massive in terms of its opening and, and the space that you will have and the feel that you'll have and the landscaping that's on there will be done as part of the development. This happens to be secret places actually in Madison and if you haven't been there I'd encourage you to go take a look because um, will, ours will have the, a similar feeling. Um, um, that happens to be a Viridian development. Um, my understanding is they're doing, doing the same thing at Autumn Lake right now which is on the east side of Madison. So there's several pictures of, of, how, of that place and then uh, oh, I want to go back you can see the stream in this of how it will mm -hmm. recirculate and that provides for additional infiltration and movement of stormwater throughout the development. Um, this next picture then is actually of a, of a development that was done in, um, in Eau Claire that is one of, uh, that includes the curvilinear design and, and it's an example of a bridge there and then, and then the next page is another view of that same bridge so it gives you an idea of the size and magnitude of the multi-trail system, okay? Um, one last item and I'm, I'm done so thank you for your time. Uh, this last one is a, a slide that Rick Harrison oftentimes uses and, and when you take a look at how the streets are developed and pedestrian trails are done first and then when he layers the lots in he tweaks the design so that all of the homeowners have some viewing corridor in most cases he can't say that all homes at 100 percent have viewing corridors where you don't see another home but in the majority of cases they're moving and you know they're they're positioned to look toward open spaces now the key to carrying out this design will be our covenants and restrictions for one in our uh, architectural control committee to make sure homes are built on the, the, the lots in the way that they're intended and ultimately we'll be submitting them to you today we're getting you know your feedback on the design itself and the concepts and, and your initial impressions okay with that um, thank you and hopefully that was abbreviated enough and highlighted some of the key items we'll take any questions you may have thank you Ron uh, we'll open it up for questions Mr. Steiner please um, Ron, in that downtown area or business district, whatever you call it, how wide are the streets there? So those, uh, if, if you take a look at that particular section, there's actually only one main boulevard coming in and then an offshoot street. So that boulevard coming in, I, you can maybe help me on that, Fred. That uh, it's, it's, it, it, would, it will go down to 40, 40 feet at the residential piece, right? But prior to that, it, the width is? So that, that street there would be of a wider commercial nature and, 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 uh, and then the side street coming down would be the, um, either the 36 or 40 foot and that will come with the actual submission. Brad. And a, a follow-up, go ahead. Um, would you allow parking on both sides and, and what kind of parking would it be? Parallel parking, pull in the, how, how, how would people park and shop and move around? So, so um, um, it would be parallel parking, not on, on the main street, it would be parallel parking, not uh, angle parking. And, and um, as we develop the concept for that area, that those streets we will have to provide you with more information on. Okay, I can't, to be honest with you, that we've spent most of our time to date to get feedback on the residential piece, and then we'll move into the commercial piece and make sure that that satisfies the requirements as well. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Doyle, please. Well, thank you for the presentation, and I'd just like to comment that I like the interesting design concept and that it's environmentally friendly and does put an emphasis on walking and biking. Um, I'd also like to say that I'm comfortable with the number of multifamily and feel like that's in alignment with being more environmentally friendly as that's usually a more environmentally friendly use of, of a small amount of space. 
Um, I was glad that you mentioned too that there were kind of a variety of price points with the inclusion of the villas because that was my main concern when I heard um, you know higher home values is usually that creates a barrier to entry for a lot of folks but glad that you were cognizant of trying to have um, different price points included. Um, I'd also like to echo the calls for a school site as that can also promote walking and biking within communities so I'm glad to hear that you're engaging in conversations to that end. All right, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Diaz, please. Thank you. This is just comments, but I want to say I like the development a lot. I like the emphasis on trails and biking and walking. Um, people of all types love to do those things. I like the variety of housing, um, especially in the single family homes. Um, I like that there's less pavement. Um, one of the one of the most common complaints I get is, is, is about speeds on residential streets. People are worried that their kids you know, are playing near cars that are going really, really fast. And if you build a road that looks like a major road, people are going to drive fast like it's a major road just because that's that's what people do. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm as guilty of this as anyone else. And, you know, we can do stuff like put a cop car there or, or try to slow people down. But to me, if you want people to drive slow, you design a road so people drive slow on it. And, and, and I'm really glad that, that that's what you've done here. Um, I love the, that it's environmentally friendly. Um, and I really just in general like the thought and care that's gone into this development. I think Verona is a very special community and I like it when developers come to us and with, with something they've actually put some thought into. So thank you for that. Thank you. Mr. Linder, please. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, first, I'd like to start with some questions, I guess. I hope my mic is working or not. But, um, the houses, the villas, who does it, is there like a standard design for those? They, they all look similar? Is there like requirements for there, design? There, there, there is not. I mean, the one thing that I want to highlight is that, um, and we have numerous example plans that we can show over time, but they're not intended to look um, like, you know, one looks like the other. Um, with the covenants and restrictions that we have, we'll provide opportunities for people to vary the look and feel as long as they obviously they fit on the the lot that they have so so you allow, it, you, you allow anybody to design and build in this area or yes, design only yes those will be at, you know at this point in time the answer to that question is yes they would be available for sale just like any single family lot would be um, there will be maybe I should highlight this there will be a homeowners association that overlays the entire development and that will take care of some of the public space things that we're not dedicating and then there'll be individual homeowners associations that oversees each of the three villa locations. Okay. Um, who maintains the uh, area in the roundabouts? So what we- Not the roundabouts, the cul-de-sacs. Cul cul-de-sacs, correct. At this point in time, we've um, um, highlighted four of those that we specifically plan to designate as parkland. And for those that are larger than those would be maintained by the parks department. Okay. Um, so any smaller ones that would not be designated would then be handled by the homeowners association. So there's a homeowners association fee for the whole development? Correct. Okay. Um, you showed a picture of uh, Ostego, Minnesota and didn't look like there's many trees on that picture. From that, that first... Uh, yeah, not just small trees, it not look like any tree. Like yeah, that, it, you, you know, in that, in that and that could be what, what we will submit with ours because everybody approaches development different. We'll be submitting a landscape plan mm -hmm. so that you will be able to know and see how we're taking care of those landscaped areas. Yeah, the more the better. <laughs> um, the, the next question is you had a, a slide with the pass and some were called private pass. Mm -hmm. what, what is that? What does that exactly mean? Does it mean? It means somebody not in the neighborhood can't use it, or what does that mean? No, they would not be dedicated to the public. So, for example, like y y using the, using the uh, um, and I don't know what they did on Ostego, Minnesota, but if you go back to that, there's that path that goes from the cul-de-sac over to the uh, uh, residential street there. That may not be, we have a few of those that are not dedicated to the public because they're smaller paths. The homeowners association then would be responsible for caring for those and entering into a contract with somebody to, to mow and to um, remove the snow in the winter months. Okay, but somebody not living in development could still use those? Oh, yeah, yes, yes, okay. yeah, they're open to the public. They're not private, they're just privately maintained. maintained. Got it, okay. Correct. Um, 
uh, overall, I agree with most of the comments already. I think it's pretty neat. I, I, we're always looking for something a little bit unique. This is definitely unique. I think it's something that if potentially, I mean, if you drive around and look at neighborhoods, you'd be pretty proud of this, I think, the way it looks. So I'm, I'm very interested in seeing how it looks. Uh, this is a general overthought. So okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Linder. Mr. Touche, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I, like Mr. Alder Linder, I have um, some comments, some concerns, and just, you know, feedback. Um, but let me start off. I, I, I agree with Mr. Or Alder Linder's final statement. It's, it's a neat looking development. I think, um, I think there's lots of potential here and um, lots of opportunity. Um, but I, I also just have some, you know, I'm always trying to think about what are the long term ramifications to the city and maintenance the durability of, of, of this kind of development. So this is really kind of my focus, you know, on our, mm -hmm. our feedback. Um, but let me just start off. I do have some concern about the one way streets and street parking. Um, I, I, they're, they're pretty narrow already. And if we're putting a bunch of houses around this, I think people are going to want to park on the street who are visiting. Um, and I, I would like to see a way for on street parking in those areas. Um, I'd heard comments about street widths, and I, I understand you're working with uh, city staff on that, and I really appreciate that. I, it's, I, my, I have some very recent experience. I was just in Aurora last weekend, um, and I was in one of these developments where the streets were def definitely narrow and had a kind of similar wind. I don't think is as interesting as what you're proposing. Um, and I was thinking, am I slowing down? You know, how how's other traffic going through here? And, and I, I went through one of these main uh, thoroughfares where there's parking only on one side and then two-way traffic, people were driving fast, and it was scary for me as a driver just going through there. Um, lots of homes, lots of people there, and, and I, I didn't see the slowdown. I, I was kind of trying to relate to the comments I'd heard from you. So I really, my personal experience, I, I still can't relate to people will really slow down. I think when people are trying to get somewhere, they're just going. And um, that's why I'm glad that you're making the wides a little bit ro wider to give some more options because there were a couple times where I thought I'd lose a mirror on my car. So, okay. um, you know, on the maintenance side of things, you know, we, we covered this in the public works committee, but, uh, our director pointed this out very well that, you know, I, I really, I share his concerns about when you're stacking pipes and crossing over pipes, um, the kind of maintenance that's going to be required to re you know, replace them, you know, the wear and tear that happens on water pipes and sewer pipes get replaced sooner than other ones do. And in some cases where you had bends and, and, and joints, uh, we'd be shutting down entire roads. And when there are, a lot, there are dead ends in this development, I, I, I can't imagine the kind of nightmare that public works is going to have to go through the, to, to basically cause people to drive on sidewalks to get out because the middle of the road is gone um, or is a giant hole. So I really hope you continue working with um, the, you know, our staff to make sure that's properly addressed because admittedly it's great to develop right now, but 20 plus years down the road, it's going to be an issue for those people who bought into that and you guys will be long gone. So, um, it's one of my comments, um, stormwater facilities. Um, I, I just want the council to be, you know, when I think about maintenance, uh, this proposed development has approximately 10, uh, more stormwater facilities and a at the city we have 80. So that means we're going to be adding 13% more stormwater facilities just for this development. And again, it's a maintenance cost for the city. We have, we have to maintain these. We have to keep them safe. I think a gateway, which has stormwater issues, that we're having to bring in a portable pump when they're hitting those 100-year storm, storms every five years. Um, there's some sarcasm there. Um, but it's been, it, 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 I have some concerns when there's 10 or so of these stormwater facilities What's the, what's the long-term maintenance on these? And I think it could, has the potential to be a undue burden on the residents in this area because of some of the covenants that we're gonna have to put in there and the homeowners association, they, this could be a real problem. So I, I really want you to, again, work with uh, Public Works to make sure, our director to make sure that these are put in consideration. I think us as a council, if we're gonna approve something like this, we also just need to throw that in our considerations list. So. Um, last, w last point I had is, um, some e easement issues with the sidewalks. And I know from experience watching TDS pull fiber through my neighborhood uh, a couple years ago and getting calls from my neighbors on 
losing shrubs and losing bushes and and all this uh, effort that you know TDS is trying to go through to try to reduce the amount of damage you're doing to people's property, but they have a legal right to do this. And um, be because of how the sidewalks are being placed and the distances off the road, I, 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 I'm just, my crystal ball tells me there's gonna be a lot of confusion with these homeowners as far as well, what's really their property and what can be messed with by, by, the, by contractors. And, um, and I think it's, I like to keep things simple. And I think as beautiful as this is, I think there's ways we can simplify some of these things and make them less complicated yet still nice. Um, and I apologize, I do have one more comment. I say I skipped over it. Um, you know, sidewalks. You know, I, thank you, um, Mr. Uh, J Elder Linder, for bringing up the sidewalk issue. But at least on some of these cul-de-sacs, I, I can't tell from the new drawings. You know, I know we during public works we talked about it. You know, I have, I really want to see sidewalks in front of every house. You know, I think in some of the, the cul-de-sac areas you had done like a half a sidewalk cut across the island and then dove out of the neighborhood. I think I think it's really important that everyone has a sidewalk, you know, even just for anyone living in a house that doesn't have one, you know, for the kids to just visit someone else they're crossing a road. And I think if we can have a sidewalk where they can go around to visit a neighbor, I think that would be a safer situation for sure. them. That is all for me. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Gaskell, did you have? Yes, please. Um, again, just a couple of questions and comments. I really like this design. The one thing I'm a little concerned about, and I feel like the parkland is more of a stormwater amenity than an actual parkland. Um, and presumably the villas are going to be a lower price point. We might have some young families there. I don't see really anywhere up in that corner where there's dedicated parkland for kids to get out and play. So I don't know if there's a way to scoot some of this around, but you know, the, the, it makes sense from a stormwater perspective to have this linear park structure, but I, the largest dedicated parkland is actually not accessible to most of this property. Um, I like that it's next to the multifamily. That makes great sense, but getting your kids there without going with them or sending them on the bike, uh, I don't know how many parents are going to do that, and then all of a sudden we have people driving there. Um, so if there's any way at all to, I don't know, maybe someone from the Parks and Rec Commission can explain what their concerns were, I'd like to hear that as well, because we haven't really discussed that. Adam, I don't know if you have any... Can I, I'll comment, can I yes, comment please, on one thanks. thing? Yes, please, thanks. Sure. If you take, I put this, um, you know, this slide back up there just to kind of highlight. Um, first of all, right in the center of the screen there where it's showing that larger rectangular block. So in, in there is a 3.6 acre park in that central area there. That's not in addition to the multi-trail. Now, um, parks uh, brought up um, one of the challenges that frequently they have because you'll notice that that's a park combined with a stormwater area that um, it appears that oftentimes when storm and park are dedicated at the same time that parks loses out to stormwater frequently. Um, so that's an area that we, you know, will take a look at and emphasize when we go through and get our final stormwater calcs and the like that we make sure that it works so that there is that larger park area in the center of that, of the development overall. Okay. Um, there is, a, we had a slide that we showed at parks where we took a, in accordance with the park requirements, uh, um, and I apologize, I may not be remembering it correctly, but uh, within a half mile of each um, uh, park, we should have concentric zones where it overlaps. And just to the south here in the Kettle Creek North development is a four and a half acre park that's not far off from our development. So when you take a look at the larger area, there are numerous parks that are available to the residents of both of those. Um, subdivision so thank you um, I'd like to echo mr. Touche's concern that and agree with him that we need to have sidewalks for in front of every home um, and to that end I would not want the expectation to be that if you're on a bike that you need to be on the path I think all of our streets need to accommodate cyclists no matter what um, bikes are a legal vehicle in Wisconsin and sometimes because there's a a dedicated path nearby there's an expectation that's where you should be if you're on your bike and I would hope that yeah. we're not pushing that by talking about that our streets are for cars and the paths are for bikes um, I'd also like to see these paths be 12 feet rather than 10 if they're going to be as popular as we're hoping 10 feet immediately is 
is too uh, narrow for even two bikes to pass safely. And then we've got kids and people walking dogs and everything else we hope that is happening on these paths. I'd like to see them 12 feet. And then this may not be something you can answer. Do you have an idea of the, just the general square footage of a single family home versus what the villa might be? You know, I can't, at the moment, I can't answer okay. that. I'm not trying to avoid that question, but we will have answers to that when we okay. when we come back to be able to make sure you feel comfortable <laughs> with what we're gonna um, suggest for the covenants and restrictions. And then was there just a conscious decision to put the multifamily basically in the corner? You know, I, uh, I'll let, um, would one of you guys want to answer that? I believe that's where it's at in the North neighborhood plan. And, okay. and we didn't change any of that. Okay. And we felt that it, it basically is the appropriate spot as it relates to that. Now we have a couple of different designs. I can tell you that right now we haven't finalized that we're looking at that front area. And, and there is some wrap of the kettle with the multifamily in one of those designs. So we'll have more detail on that when we come back as well. Okay. And I'm also glad to hear there'll be street trees as part of the plan because it, it is a very stark difference looking at the pictures you presented of what the meandering walks will look like if there's a street tree there and then you know that aerial photo where there's there, right. nothing so. yeah. mr linder please yeah can i follow up on a, on a one as miss gaskell brought up so this drawing is most recent so yes where this the park where's the park yeah right there where you're pointing actually so if you go to the they, they, it's just there's 3.6 acres in there that's designated the visuals not showing that uh, in the concept plan the way that it could. So where, where, like if there's playground sets, is that the only spot in? No, so there, you, so in that 3.6 acres that would be in that central area, then we plan in the, in the, in, we haven't laid out all of the, you know, playground and landscape equipment yet but it's likely that there would be one or more of those in the cul-de-sac items that would be called, um, some people call them tot lots, you know, there's other um, names similar to that. Tot lots. Tot lots. They're the tiny little. So there would be places. built into those larger ones, smaller little neighborhood gathering places, which would include playground equipment. So there'd be one main park and then two? Several smaller ones several scattered ones. about. Okay. Go ahead, Ms. Gaskell. Yeah, to that end, then, it'd be great if this was a tot lot up by the villas, but also right now there isn't a connection from this cul-de-sac that I can see. It looks so like that, there's a gap so in that system. So if you system. take a look at that, Sarah, in the new one, we've got a connection that comes through there to the villas and to the other side, I think. Okay, so this is updated then from the, the path map that was uh, provided. This there is a connection. I'm okay, right that's great. Yeah. All right, thanks. Other feedback? Any? Uh, Ms. Ricky? I just feel like I should say something, even though most of my comments were already stated or questions asked, so thanks for responding to those. Um, as part of the Parks, Recreation, Forestry Committee, I was at that presentation as well, and um, my understanding is that the, the land that's around the wetland would be developed as usable land, too, as part of a park system, and um, we were urged to kind of think of the parks as more of a like the meandering paths being part of the park system and um, some of the members of the parks committee liked the idea of getting people out walking and and biking and um, you know communicating with their neighbors and all of that that goes along with that um, and so yeah in general I'm in support of um, this development and the other comments that were made I agree with okay, thank you <laughs> and I didn't highlight, thank you, the, the kettle itself and the trails were, were, and the reason we asked for park credit there, we're, we're um, anticipating a complete uh, landscape of that kettle area and making it an amenity where you'd be able to walk at a minimum around it, in some cases within it, depending on the ability to, to design it that way. So that would be, a, that would be an amenity um, as part of the overall development. Uh, the only thing, and I had opportunities at the Planning Commission, but I just wanted to, uh, and Ron, you and I have talked about this, so I want the council to just think about this a little bit. So when you have the curved streets, and I, I don't really have a problem with that, especially if they're wide enough, but when you look at what's on our screen or you look at even the hit nap by 11 here, you have to keep in mind that this is a significant development. 
So although you look at this piece of paper and it looks like, yes, it's very curved, um, you have to keep in mind that it's a, it's a pretty big development. And I just mentioned that because I'm worried about the speed as well on there. And I want to make sure that people aren't traveling uh, too fast so that it is a safety issue. Mm -hmm. So again, my, my main point is that when you look at it here, it looks like, yeah, it's pretty curvy, but it's going to be a big area. Yeah. Any, Mr. Diaz? Yep. Thank you. I just want to make a comment about trails. I work by the uh, Pheasant Branch Conservancy and the trails out in Middleton, and I see people in it constantly. Um, and so I think I think trails actually is, is kind of a, a you know, th it's good to have a variety of parks, right? Like you want to have stuff for younger kids, you want to have soccer fields, things like that. But I also think that a lot of people are going to use the trails, and I think that's uh, it's it should be part of our park system. Mr. Linder, please. A follow up to your question: What, what have some of these previous designs? What have they done for speed control? Is it just the design itself was 100% solution, or was there some other things that were done? Um, there's there's a number of things I'll highlight, and 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 I'm going to let Rick answer that question when he comes next month in more detail, or if it's or in March, whenever it is, because he has all kinds of research and background behind how the intersections are designed. But but he will he will tell you and provide background that the the um, first of all he said make sure you tell the council this evening that after they leave they should go out and Google are wider streets safer, and he says I guarantee you that you will find out that wider streets are not safer. Um, uh, and so what he's done in his design over the years in regards to his research, as well as changes and tweaks that he's made, is the traffic calming measures have to do with the, with the radi and how they go around the vehicular dri drivers will pay more attention than on a straight street, but they also opens up at the intersection. So one of the things I think Theron's still here, one of the concerns he mentions, well, you know, when we talk with them is the, I think he calls them the number of um, connection points, you know. So he says, geez, if a pedestrian's crossing a road where it's split into a boulevard, you actually have two connection points instead of one. Well, you know, Rick will, will show you how when that occurs because it opens up it actually even though there's two points of contact it's safer because it opens up and the vision's better than if there's one where there's less uh, you know visual um, ability so so there's there's you know he can he'll speak to that in more detail when he comes but there there isn't any evidence that wider is safer generally if you keep what he would say the the your your intersections, your four-way intersections are the most dangerous of all the items. And if you keep traffic moving and separate it, you'll have fewer incidents. Ms. Casco. I'd just like to say that's exactly right. If we build it wider, we just get faster traffic. It's, it, there's a perception of safety, but you know, if you put wider, but then you allow parking on both sides, that narrows the street back down. So there's a, I completely agree. I think that this is also a neighborhood. This is not, you know, a thoroughfare. So we should size these streets appropriately for safety, but also not just have the assumption that if we make them wider, it's gonna be better. I just, I do wanna to add to that though. My major concern on the, on the narrow streets is that when there is an emergency, that the emergency vehicles can get through. And I actually had an incident today where I had a fire truck pass me on one side and an ambulance on another side, and it was on a four lane road. And also to get those emergency vehicles passing you and I've been in other communities in the area here on narrow streets and on a curve and people parked on both sides and it would be very difficult to get one emergency vehicle through and I don't ever want that to happen and I'm not saying it's, it would happen here but I don't ever want it to happen that an emergency vehicle couldn't get through on a street because it was on a curve and there were cars parked on either side we have to make sure that doesn't happen right and, and I want to highlight even our, our streets maybe slightly narrower than what y you know you would like in certain instances but they're 40 feet wide if you know 48 foot wide street you can have a bike lane on it and we're not saying that bikes can't go on the streets because they surely can but we've designed it so they don't have to um, so they're not narrow uh, an ambulance would easily be able to get by on a 40 foot or a 36 foot street well, I'm not seeing any additional hands, so Ron, on behalf of the council, we thank you, and we look forward to uh, seeing you in the next steps. All right, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Sarah, anything else from the Planning Commission? 
Thank you. We are then on Parks, Recreation, and Forestry. Ms. Rickey, please. I would like to um, move approval for a professional service agreement with MSA Professional Services for the Fireman's Park Master Plan update. We have a motion by Ms. Rickey. Is there second. a second? Second by Mr. Steiner. Ms. Rickey, please. Um, this service agreement will provide an updated conceptual master plan for Fireman's Park to include possible changes to key park features, including maintaining the boat landing in its current location, a modified beach house floor plan, a conceptual change to the entrance into the park, and adding two youth soccer fields to the park. The MSA professional services agreement was recommended to city council unanimously, unanimously by the Parks and Rec Committee on January 17th, 2018 for a cost not to exceed $5,000. Thank you, Ms. Rickey. Questions or comments for the commission or for staff? Questions or comments? Seeing none, all those in favor of approval of the professional services agreement with MSA signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. And that motion carries. Ms. Rickey, please. Under 10D2, um, we have, um, I move to deny the claim for vehicle damage from Michael Patrick, 4153 Iroquois Drive, Madison, Wisconsin. We have a motion by Ms. Rickey. Second. Is there a sec seconded by Mr. Steiner? Ms. Rickey, please. A claim of damage dated November 6, 2017, in which a claim that rocks were thrown from a grass mower cutting grass in the median of Main Street near the intersection of Cross Country Road and damaged the front quarter panel and driver's side view mirror. A police report was prepared on November 10, 2017, under report number VE17-06812. The claim was for $830.11. The Parks and Recreation Committee reviewed the claim and recommended not to approve the claim by a three to zero vote at their January 17th, 2018 meeting. Thank you. Questions for the commission or for staff? Seeing none, the motion is to deny the claim. I'm sorry, Mr. Oh, Linder. Okay, I just want a clarification. It was a deny or approve. Thank you. Yeah. The motion is to, uh, deny. to deny the claim. Again, the motion is to deny the claim for vehicle damage from Michael Patrick. All those in favor of denial uh, of the claim, denying the claim, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. And that motion carries. Ms. Rickey, anything else in Parks, Recreation, and Forestry? No. Thank you. Public Works, Sewer, and Water. Mr. Touche, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Under item 10E1, I am making a motion to approve an agreement with Dane County regarding a pedestrian bridge over Badger Mill Creek at Badger Prairie County Park. We have a motion by Mr. Touche. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Diaz. Mr. Touche, please. As part of our WSDOT, uh, Wisconsin Department of Transportation Roadway Bridge Replacement Project along Old Highway PB, um, an additional crossing is required to maintain access during construction and enhance the long-term pedestrian benefits uh, within the city of Verona. Um, this pedestrian bridge is required to receive Wisconsin Department of Transportation funding for roadway of this project. Um, by way of exp uh, explanation, uh, back last year uh, at the end of September, um, if uh, we had talked about this, and hopefully the council remembers, um, we're putting this bridge in essentially to save money so that we can get federal funding by, putting, by replacing two bridges on old PB. Um, in this agreement, um, some key highlights are um, the we did open, the bids were opened uh, in the middle of January at a total amount of $52,200. Uh, the county has agreed to pay $20,000 of that amount with the city picking up the remaining balance. Um, but we had already, we have an agreement with the county that our portion will not exceed $50,000. So our portion in this case will, uh, according to the bid, will be $30,220. Uh, so this is a good deal for the city. Um, in addition to that, the county has agreed that they will be maintaining the bridge and uh, be taking care of it. And then if the city were to extend our pedestrian walkways along uh, Old PB, we will uh, have a right to use it along with that. Thank you for the explanation, Mr. Touche. Questions or comments for the committee or for staff? Questions or comments? 
Seeing none, the motion is to approve uh, an agreement with Dane County regarding pedestrian bridge over Badger Mill Creek at the Badger Prairie County Park. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. And that motion carries. Mr. Uh, Touche. Uh, at this time, I would like to um, jump to item number three on the public works agenda so that we can cover this in open session. Uh, okay. So with the committee's permission. Uh, unanimous consent permission. to do that. You have it, Mr. Touche. Fantastic. All right, item 10E3. I'm making a motion to approve the acquisition of property for well at, a, at appraised amount contingent upon public works director and city attorney uh, approving f uh, the final agreement. <laughs> wow, that was an ugly motion considering I'm reading my scratch notes from the meeting. Let's try this again. I'm making a motion to approve acquisition of property for a well at the appraised amount contingent on public works director. I'm missing something in here. It's not reading right. Contingent on public works director. Ah, oh, thank you, Mr. Jacobson. I appreciate it. Some additional scribbles. All right. Acquisition of property for well number six at the appraised value contingent upon city attorney and director of public works. A final approval of the agreement. We have a motion by Mr. Touche. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Diaz. Mr. Touche. Uh, in this case, I'm actually going to defer to um, Director of Public Works, Darren Jacobson, and I'll give you your notes back. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Jacobson, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The Well 6 site is located off of Wayland Road, east of the bypass, north right where Liberty Drive would extend and I believe there is a figure in the packet. Uh, we did an appraisal for the property and the appraisal came in and I extended it to the to the property owner and they have accepted the value as it was noted in the appraisal which was $94,000 an acre based on the comparable sales that was generated and used uh, for that value setting. The area of acquisition is 1.3 acres and some of the other items that were requested, I shouldn't say requested, discussed uh, w to be within the agreement was just the way the building looks. Um, so it looks aesthetically pleasing because um, they do own a lot of other land in the area that they would plan on developing in the future and they want the building to look aesthetically pleasing and not something that just looks like a spec building. Um, which we would want to do anyways just for security reasons. It would mirror the look of our southeast booster station, which is located off of M at the intersection of Wayland, um, where the building would be placed towards the rear of the, lo of the lot and just landscape screening around the building, which is all typical items what we would do through the site plan review process. Um, one other item that was discussed was a sign towards the front, but I don't, through the discussion at the committee level that needs to be dealt with at the at site plan review and plan commission approval for overall master planning of that development not specific to this accusation and then the other thing too that will be included in the agreement but not part of the motion is that this deal is dependent on the public service commission approval of the well site so if the PSC does not approve the well site then we will just null and void this this agreement um, so we ultimately won't acquire the property any other questions any questions for mr jacobson thank you for oh. that for their explanation you're welcome any additional questions seeing none the motion uh then is to would you mind just reading that motion again there <laughs> servants clear since you have the notes yep no problem mr mayor Accusation of property for well six at appraised value contingent upon city attorney and director of public works approving final form of the agreement. Thank you, Mr. Jacobson, for reading that. We just want to always make sure people are clear on what they're voting on. Yep, so you're welcome. With that, not seeing any questions, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. And that motion carries. Thank you. Mr. Touche. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, item 10E2, um, I would like, like it if um, 
um, Mr. Jacobson could describe uh, what we're trying to do here and then I will be making a motion to move into closed session to discuss. I also believe we have some other closed session items so I will let the mayor kind of help me direct yeah. how to do this. Thank All you. Right. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. Part of the pedestrian project that we're going to construct in 2018, it includes four projects out of the Pet and Bike Plan. And due to get the, to get this project done, there's five parcels we need to acquire land from. One of the parcels, which is City of Verona, and the three other are privately owned. We the areas of acquisition are very small for the project. We minimize the amount of impacts to any property owner due to the improvements that need to be done to complete the project. To give you an, an idea of some of the areas, we're talking about 0 0.08 acres, 0 0.06 acres of temporary limited easement, 0 0.04 acres of right of way, 0 0.02 of temporary limited easement. And one of the larger acquisitions is along the west side of Locust Avenue, which stems all the way from the southern limits at Bruce Street all the way up to the northern limits of the property owner, which is 200 feet south of Locust is 0.21 acres. So the areas are, are very small, but there are minor impacts, of course. So I have discussed um, certain negotiations with the property owners and have feedback from them. And that's where I would like to um, get the council's feedback on the offers because part of the state budget, we cannot condemn for pedestrian improvements noted that are identified for this project so we have to work with the property owners to get an agreement that they're ultimately going to accept so thank you you're welcome so with that we have two items uh, for a closed session uh, mr. touche you had asked about uh, how to do that uh, prior to the motion, if you would read the section under 10-2, prior to where it says the council may convene, do the same thing under Old Business 11-A, and then since it's uh, both of the closed sessions are referring to the exact same statute, section of the statute, we could do one motion for both. Uh, do Could we, Mr. Clymer? I, I would just say that I, I, I think that... Um, you're going to want to do two motions. And just two separate people, ones? People may have a, a, a difference of, a, they may be willing to do first. Okay. Okay. So let's do the, let's do the, uh, let's do the uh, one under 10 two first then. Mr. Touche. Do we want to talk at least publicly about the second item before we do any motions to um, go into closed session? Just trying to be open and, you know, we talked about what, no? I, I mean, I, if you, Please. If you want me to, I can give a brief explanation. Please. So item 11A is the um, discussion and action regarding the uh, contribution that the, the city would be making to the school district for its project. And, uh, you know, we had our, our, our last common council meeting. Uh, we had uh, a brief discussion in open session and then went in closed session and then came out of closed session and, and, and made an announcement. And one of the things that the council had directed city staff to do would be to prepare a term sheet that could be discussed and then ultimately shared with the school district and the public. And that's, that term sheet would uh, lead to a, a development agreement or at least an agreement with the school district. And so based on the request by the common council, city staff did put together a term sheet and that's the item that uh, the city staff's recommendation is that we discuss the term sheet in closed session um, with the idea that there's definitely the potential that we would come out of closed session and make some further announcements like we did at the last common council meeting. Great, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Touche. All right, I'm gonna make a motion to move into closed session. The common council may reconvene in closed session as authorized by Wisconsin statute 19.85 paren one paren e for the purpose of deliberating or negotiating the purchase of public properties the investing of public funds or conducting other specified public business whenever competitive or bargaining reasons deem a closed session necessary. The Common Council may reconvene an open session to discuss and take action on the subject matter discussed in the closed session. Okay. 
We have a motion by Mr. Touche. Is there a second? Second. Second by Ms. Doyle. Uh, this does require a roll call vote, but we do have the second one. Or we can go into closed session on this one first and then. Yeah, I, mean, I, I was suggesting a roll call vote on this and then give them the second one. Uh, the, uh, the second one. Okay. So if we'd read the roll on uh, the first one, please. Alder Riki? Aye. Alder Steiner? Aye. Alder Touche? Aye. Alder Diaz? Aye. Alder Doyle? Aye. Alder Gaskell? Aye. Alder Linder? Aye. And then the second one, Mr. Yep. Touche? Uh, this is item uh, 11A, uh, Cost Associated Public Roads. I am making a motion. We'll go into closed session. The Common Council may convene. May convene in closed session as authorized Wisconsin Statute 19.85 paren 1 paren e for the purpose of deliberating and negotiating the purchase of public properties, the investing in public funds, or conducting other specified public business whenever competitive or bargaining reasons deem a closed session necessary. The Common Council may reconvene in open session to discuss and take action on the subject matter discussed in closed session. We have a motion by Mr. Touche. Is there a second? Second. Taken by Mr. Linder. Again, this requires a roll call vote. Ms. Clark, if you would, please. Alder Riki? No. Alder Steiner? Aye. Alder Touche? Aye. Alder Diaz? No. Alder Doyle? Aye. Alder Gaskell? Aye. Alder Linder? Aye. And the motion passes. Uh, we will met the, let the minutes reflect that uh, Alders Riki and Diaz voted no. We are in closed session at 8.37 and uh, city staff, legal counsel, and elected officials, you may remain in the room. One, two, three, four. <laughs> we need uh, two more members here before we can officially reconvene. Checking. Check, check. So we need one more. There we go. Well, don't we need Jack, or we just got enough the way it is? We'll get started here. We have a quorum, so we will proceed. Mr. Touche. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, under item 10E2, I'm making a motion to approve the acquisition of parcels two, three, four, and five for project 2017-113, consistent to the closed session discussion. So we have a motion by Mr. Touche, second, second by Mr. Diaz. Questions or comments for staff or the committee? Questions or comments? Seeing none, all those in favor of that, of that motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carried. Uh, under old business, Mr. Kleinmeyer? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So for the benefit of the public and, and for the council, what I'm going to do is, is uh, address some of the terms that uh, are in the term sheet that we will be sharing with the school district tomorrow and, and then with, with the public. I'm not gonna go into great detail um, on, on all of these terms and I'm, I'm not even gonna cover all of them, but uh, maybe just hit a few high points. Um, so one thing that uh, the, the council is going, one of the terms is going to be related to the payments. And our, uh, the language that we're gonna propose in the term sheet is again, a payment of up to $5 million. Um, we do believe that it's gonna be appropriate to have a, a payment schedule similar with other construction projects. Uh, the payment schedule that we will propose will be related to um, the essentially the annual bond payment schedule or bond issuance schedule for the city of Verona and then also related to when um, 
the construction project hits certain uh, deadlines or um, percentage completion. We will um, also be addressing the acquisition of the Sugar Creek property. Um, as, as I think the has been said, on, I think on, on some social media um, and also was at the, the council was asked to address this earlier in the meeting, the, the members of the common council, all of them would like to see the new century building preserved. I think uh, there's an expectation that we will treat this uh, property like the Matt's house. Um, so one of the things that the city is going to like to see in this agreement is the ability to acquire the Sugar Creek property. Um, that it is going to be remediated to a certain level. Um, we're not going to ask the school district to take down the new century building, but the other structures on the property are things that we're going to ask the school district to take down. Um, my understanding is there's a certain number of very mature trees on the property, and to the extent that those trees can be saved, that's also something that we're going to want to want to work with the school district on uh, uh, for that property. Um, another uh, portion of the term sheet and the development agreement will address all of the road improvements that would need to be um, completed for the project. Um, there's going to be an expectation on the city's behalf in light of the payment that would be made that the school district would uh, do handle all the permitting, handle all the construction, and all, and to the extent that there's any land acquisitions that are associated with the road improvements, that would all need to be handled by the school district. Um, and, and just the last uh, topic that I want to touch on for purpose of the term sheet would be um, the city and the school district to date have a cooperative relationship with respect to youth use of uh, school district properties by city residents within the city of Verona. Um, example would be use of the swimming pools, use of gyms. And that is something that we would like to see maintained going into the future. Um, the other thing that we would like to see is um, public use of the Stewart's Woods property. And so we plan to address that issue within the development agreements. Um, I, if, if I have missed any of the topics or stated anything incorrectly, please correct, uh, please correct me and I will restate them. But I think I hit on the high points. I believe that covers the major issues. Mr. Linder, please. I just, I guess when I was listening, I just want to be clear that the new century building would be included in the property that the city would acquire. Correct. That is correct, Elder Linder. Seeing no more uh, questions on that, that concludes the uh, discussion on 11A, agenda item 11A. We are now on agenda item 11B, selection of a city council representative to the Planning Commission. Are there any nominations? Mr. Diaz, please. Thank you. I nominate Alder Gaskell. Alder Gaskell has been nominated. Any other nominations? Are there any other? Mr. Linder? I'll nominate Alder Touche. Alder Touche has been nominated. Are there any other nominations? Seeing none, um, we've in the past, uh, it's been requested for a roll call vote, so I will ask uh, the clerk to read the roll, please. Alder Steiner. Touche. Alder Touche. Touche. Alder Diaz. Alder Gaskell. Alder Doyle. Alder Gaskell. Alder Gaskell. Alder Gaskell. Alder Linder. Touche. Alder Riki. Alder Gaskell. And that motion fails. Six votes are required. So we are on new business. Um, do we have any operator's license this evening? I have none. We have none. Thank you. So a motion for adjournment would be in order. We have a motion by Mr. Diaz. Is there a second? Second by Ms. Ricky. All those in favor of adjournment signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carried. We are adjourned. Thank you, everyone.